So hello and welcome to another episode of the Toronto Dog Whisperer. Actually, this is the first episode of uh, a dog cast, like a podcast for dog lovers. And I have with me uh, a very gracious uh, guest. His name is Mark, and he is the president of an amazing company. Uh, but that's not why he's here. He's here because he's a dog lover, and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so you have a couple dogs, right? I have two dogs. Honey, okay. well, Honey and Tiger were my dogs. Unfortunately, now I have one dog. Okay. Called Honey. Tiger okay. passed away at the ripe age of 14 about six months ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, they were great companions of mine for a long time. And um, Honey is now very old, and um, but still a fantastic dog. And the dogs have been a big part of my life. Yeah. So did you grow up with dogs or did you get them later in life? I grew up with dogs. And something which is quite amazing when I think back about dogs is that I grew up in a city, London, okay, um, and then sort of suburbs of London, but not in a great dog environment. My mum was a huge animal lover, mm -hmm. and from a very young age, I always loved dogs. And I can't think from where it wasn't really from dogs we necessarily had at home. We had a small, we had a small Lassa Absa called oh, okay. um, Florence, and my mum was always famous for giving dogs <laughs> weird names as well. And um, we had a small ass house called Florence that was our sort of family dog, who I wasn't that close to. It was a little rat-like dog and what have you. But one of my earliest memories is badgering my mum for a dog when I would have been 10 or 11. And my mum getting me a Border Collie cross that oh, was wow. totally unsuitable to city living. <laughs> and it was one of those famous dogs that had to go and be given to a friend on a farm uh, a year later. Okay. <laughs> that uh. I only realised recently what that really meant. <laughs> um, but my mum was a huge dog lover, so I'm sure it went to a nice place, a whatever, whatever happened. Yeah. Um, so it was amazing. But, you know, even as a teenager, I, my summer job was working in a dog kennels. So really? I would get on two buses. I remember to, to out to go from where I lived in Richmond out to Chessington. That was like an hour away to start at six o'clock in the morning to muck out dogs. And this was a dog kennel that had two sections, sort of domestic dogs, people on holidays, mm -hmm. and all the guard dogs and working dogs that were kept there during the day, often who were working at night. So pretty challenging dogs. And thinking back, I didn't get paid much. It was a really brutal dog, clearing up a lot of dog poo and just kind of dealing with some pretty difficult dogs. But I was so obsessed with dogs, I loved it. And that's so contrary to sort of like, there's nothing in my character or background that would lead me necessarily to be a dog lover. So it must have been something I was totally born with. Um, but an interesting piece of history is when I was first born, we lived in right in central London. And at that time, we had a German shepherd called Beaver. And it was a beautiful dog. And the German Shepherd called Beaver, who I was too young to really know, was named after my mum's best friend, had a clothes shop that was just starting in Kensington Church Street called Beaver. Beaver went on to be a huge fashion brand. Wow. Our first dog was named after the owner of Beaver that oh, mum was awesome. pal with at the time. Pals <laughs> with at the time. So, so from whenever I can remember, they were always part of my life. Yeah. Um, and I remember going up through my life as I moved to Hong Kong, started my first business. I always had dogs in Hong Kong and like I actually had a housekeeper at my house. I wasn't married, didn't have a girlfriend, but I had a housekeeper at my house really because I was at work all day and I had dogs and I always had at least one or two dogs all the time and um, employed someone there full time to look after them so that I could have them and they were my great respite on weekends and free time and, yeah. and mixture always rescue strays, dogs I'd adopt or find or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's funny, if some people can go through a list of all the cars they've ever owned, I can name every dog that's ever come into my life. Yeah, oh yeah, me yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Me too. I, I always find it interesting people's connection with dogs. I watched a documentary the other day about kind of the history and the origins of the relationship between humans and dogs. And, and it goes back a long, long way. The first domesticated animal ever. Estimates were somewhere between any, like I, the research that I found was a little bit all over the place, but minimum of 10,000 years ago. Yeah. And the oldest record was 100,000 years ago. There's some new genetic um, marking that they're doing to, to look at like how long has this 
been going on, this development. And the oldest ones that they found is like 100,000 years ago. And in Europe, they they found fossils that are like 30,000 years old. Anyway, so the relationship between human beings and dogs has is a very old one. Like it's an ancient relationship. It is. And what's fascinating to me is to look at the relationship between humans and dogs, particularly as it pertains to work. Yes. So dogs have been working animals for humans and have been put to work by humans for thousands of years, whether it's carrying things, going to war, mm -hmm. even to modern times where I'm fascinated by the amount of good dogs can do in society. You know, dogs is very limited resources because the sums don't add up very easily for how much it costs to professionally train a dog. But when you see a dog um, working with someone with autism or PTSD or visiting a simple hospital to... Yep give people a nice gentle feeling about petting a dog yeah, to me it's an amazing thing and it's dogs i think maybe have become more pets in modern society mm. but that started out as a relationship of a master and a servant for sure uh and that's really interesting to me yeah absolutely i mean I'm, I'm a huge fan of trying to understand human behavior obviously I'm an HR that's kind of yep. like my wheelhouse. But trying to understand human behavior as it pertains to the old part of us. Because that old part of us is is very ingrained into who we are. Whether it's as evident as, as we make it out to be. And for sure, I think there was a mutually beneficial relationship at the start in terms of you know, what dogs could provide in terms of like an early warning system. Because yeah. way back when, I mean, you think not even, I mean, if you go back 10,000 years ago, that's, I mean, it, it was dangerous being a human being. We were not at the top of the food chain. It yeah. wasn't, it wasn't guaranteed that you'd live past, you know, 20 or 30 years old kind of yes. thing. But so if you think of having a dog around, I know even today, like if I go camping, and and I'm out in the middle of the wilderness. I feel safe because I know that if there's going to be like a bear <laughs> or something coming out of the like, For sure, I the I, dogs will ring off I, way before. I go on a business trip. My two dogs are at home. No one goes near the house with my two dogs there without everyone in the whole street knowing about it. So yeah. absolutely, I there's still that same relationship of where dogs are there to serve and protect, and as a sort of that sort of working relationship a little bit. Yeah. Even if it started out as a working relationship, mm. I think because dogs are social animals, yeah, um, and we're social animals, yeah, I think human beings can can relate, and they can relate to us really well. Oh, for sure. And I frequently use the term in sort of master servant working. In fact, <clears throat> it's a it's a mutual dependency that comes pretty quickly. So dogs and humans have become mutually dependent in a mm -hmm. lot of respects where, um, you know, some people will look at dogs and say, well, humans control them by controlling their food and controlling their shelter. And actually, I think the relationship is far more complex than that. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think, like, I've seen some of the best, well-balanced dogs, they're actually homeless people's mm -hmm. dogs. Mm -hmm. So they don't care that they don't have a condo in downtown Toronto or a house or, you know, a nice bed to lay on. They're perfectly happy finding a piece of concrete or dirt to, to lay on. But, you know, that companionship, that, you know, relationship that you have with your dog, I think it might have started out as, you know, okay, this is a, this is a good relationship in terms of hunting or protection. But then the companionship yeah, for part sure. of it. Yeah, it's interesting. When I think about my dogs, mm. you know, on the one hand, at the leisure, I can say that the dogs, because of the dogs, it kind of restricts how you want to travel and it kind of, uh, you have to make sure you're in a house that's suitable for the dogs. I've probably walked my dogs, I think I did a calculation not long ago that over 15 years, I've walked my dogs almost the circumference of the globe. Wow. Because I take them for long walks twice mm -hmm. a day, every day. Mm -hmm. Maybe seven times out of ten, I delighted to take a walk two times, uh, one <laughs> yeah. time, I really don't want to do it today, but I've done it every single time, I never miss one. Sure. And when I look at the sort of the leisure and I look on the other side of not just the companionship they've given me, the protection they've given my house, but also the way they've helped balance me as an individual to 
individual during that time, I feel that I've got way more from them than I've given in terms of there's some really interesting times when I can look back where I've been having very difficult times and the dogs there provided some kind of balance, solidity, strength to me in a way that I wouldn't have been able to get anywhere else. And the specific things I can think of where without the dogs, things would have been very different. Can you share an example? I can. It's, um, yeah, I, I can. This is quite a personal story. But when I came to Toronto, it was 2008, the end of 2008, November, December 2008. A very tumultuous time in the world with there was a huge financial crash going on yeah. but a very tumultuous time in my life too mm-hmm. i just turned 40 um dogs were six years old or so um i just turned 40 um i was living in hong kong i had a business i'd been married for a year and a little bit we had a son and um without going too much detail um we found out that due to a medical condition We needed to come here in a big hurry to Toronto, which was never in our plans to do, Mm -hmm. and um, make sure my son was taken care of. My wife's from Canada. That's the decision was taken. We're all moving to Toronto. So during that time, um, my wife left straight away. I followed six weeks later. I had six weeks to close up my business. Now, I was one investor of many in my business, but I was also the CEO of the company company was in financial trouble due to the financial crisis. It's one of those companies that on paper was growing, 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 was fantastic. We were at the wrong end of the curve in terms of a time to sell or get out and whatever it is. And business is business. You know, at the time, the um, the, the other partners in the business said, well, Mark, if you're out, you're out. And I was wiped out of the business. So I came here, 40 years old, living in North Bay in my wife's father's basement. Um the week before I was running a company with 100 staff, a week later I'm living in North Bay, <laughs> scratching my head saying, <laughs> yeah. this is not what I expected at the age of 40 years old. And right. um, I um, bought an old Hyundai Santa Fe and yeah. I drove down to Toronto every Monday and back every Friday. I rented a little bed sit here and I went knocking on doors all the way up and down Bay Street looking for people that needed a consultant to do some work and basically, you know, I got a lot of experience in Hong Kong and China, and I sort of said, I can help you sort out your mess. Just give me a job kind of thing. Mm. It's a very tough time. So the whole world had been turned upside down. So when I I had my six weeks in Hong Kong closing everything up, and then I came back over and I brought the dogs with me on a flight of Cathay Pacific. They were down in the hold. I was up at the top, 18 hours on the plane, got them off on the other end. These dogs had never seen snow before. So we get here November the 1st, and 2008, if you look it up, was one of the worst winters for a long time. Yeah. Um, straight up to North Bay. There's already snow on the ground up in North Bay. The dogs, never seen snow before, love the snow. But what was incredible during that time, I actually was quite energized through that period because I realized, Mark, you're going to have to do it all over again. Yeah. This is really serious now. But I remember one thing specifically, North Bay, trees blowing sideways, 35, minus 35, chill factor just the most inhospitable thing every single time i would take those dogs and grab the leads they were pulling at the leads and i remember those two dogs pulling me down the road in north bay with snow everywhere and everyone looking at me like i'm crazy because nobody else is outside the solidity of the dogs who me going from being this huge successful ceo with king of the castle Mm -hmm. to being someone whose life was totally upended into a situation where I'd never predicted I would be in. Obviously changes your outlook, your demeanor, everything else. The dogs were totally the same. Whatever position you put them in, whatever circumstance was, they were there giving you unconditional love and support. So the same guy that they loved who was a superstar a few weeks ago was the same guy they loved when he was a loser a few weeks later. And, you know, what was interesting to me is that the, 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 the energy that I got from the dogs during that period in terms of they were the one constant in a time of massive change. They were also my release. So there were some pretty dark days in that time. But what I would do on a dark day, always I would grab the dogs. We would go for a long walk. The dogs and I would chat. We would walk. We would let off some steam. The dogs were so happy to be in North Bay. For them, it was a freaking dream. Yeah. Here was a landscape with space, with snow. And there's me thinking, man, I never wanted to move to North Bay. <laughs> but, you know, for the dogs, it was a dream. Yeah. And um, 
it was just a really interesting time for me. And, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know how well I'm expressing it, but the, the strength that I got from the relationship with the dog during that time was really profound for me, really profound. And there's other times when the dogs have needed me, you know, when one of the dogs gets really sick, you know, you might be carrying the dog outside to go to the bathroom because it yeah. can't stand up. And we had that with one of the dogs not long ago. And it's amazing to see with the, with the dogs that relationship of love and how it works both ways in that if it's unconditional, when they need you, you know, Honey got a, uh, an advanced vertigo not long ago. She couldn't stand up. It was in the middle of winter, so every time she wanted to go for pee or to go for a meal, we had to physically carry her outside in the snow, wow. hold her, wait for her to go to the bar somewhere. It took five minutes or 20 minutes, take her back in. Totally reliant on her. She wouldn't have survived without it. And there's been times the other way around when I'm really reliant on the dogs. Yeah. And to be able to give and receive in an unquestioning way is fantastic. And it's, to me, yeah, I gained a huge amount of strength from that. Um, and I think, you know, I think the other part of that is, to me, you know, with Honey and Tiger, who've been very, very special dogs, it comes to the end of an era where it's mapped a whole period of my life. Yeah. So my lovely wife, Jillian, when I met her, um, not when I met her, but when I'd known her for a while, when I was sort of getting serious with her, funnily enough, the day that I invited her to come and move into my then house was the day I surprised her by saying, we're going down to the rescue place and we're going to get a dog. Oh, and wow. actually we went down and we ended up getting two dogs. <laughs> um, but so the dogs have also mapped our relationship yeah. all the way through living together, getting married, all the ups and downs, having a son coming to Toronto, you know, making a success of life here. The dogs were there through the whole transition from one place to the other. So the, um, the way that they're attuned and sensitized to our lives and the rhythms of everything we've gone through is is really profound and it's um something that yeah we could draw a lot of strength from yeah absolutely i mean i i, I tell people all the time i learn so much from my dogs and not just my dogs but like all dogs and if you sit down and you, you think about it and you and you watch them and how they understand because dogs pick up on body language mm -hmm. they intuitively they're very sensitive to how you're feeling yeah. um your anxiety levels uh and, and they can pick up on those things just like i was uh when i did that talk for the, for that uh, the rotary club of, of skyline in toronto so you can't fake it yeah so yes. like for example if i'm having a bad day you know, and somebody asked me, hey, Joe, like, how you doing? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Like, you know, how you doing? I'll change the subject yeah, or yeah. something like that. But the dogs know. Yeah. The dogs know whether it is, you know, you're, you're, you're having a bad day or you're a little bit depressed or, or whatever the case may be. And they're there for you. Mm -hmm. It's this, like you said, it's this constant in your life where um, they provide that genuine companionship and they never judge you yeah yeah ever yeah yeah no it's it's a it's a it's really true they won't judge you and also with dogs what you give is what you get so yeah. as much as you invest into the relationship with the dog you will get back with interest if you don't invest in the relationship with your dog in terms of time training walking consistency the things that they need in their lives you don't get the things that you need to make the relationship successful, which may be a sense of order and behavior um, and the dog fitting in themselves with the rhythms of your social situation in your life. Yeah. Um, but very rarely do you see a situation whereby it's imbalanced in terms of you give more than you get because the dog's natural being is around giving. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you, when you drill it down, they don't ask for much, nope. you know, um, but they give an amazing amount. Like as, as human beings, we're, we're much more needy than a dog is. Like we need, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. shelter. We need, you know, clothes yeah. and, yeah. you know, we're not necessarily happy with basic food. We want things that taste nice and, and the rest of it. Whereas, you know, dogs ask very little 
Yeah. You know, they, they don't care how much money you make, yeah, yeah. what what your title is, what university yeah, yeah. or college that you went to, yeah. how many friends you have on yeah, social yeah. media. Yeah. They don't care about any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Whenever I'm working with somebody, I, I try to make them a little bit more conscious of that. So I ask them, tell me about what you get from your dog. What does your dog provide? And people will run on and and talk about all these like huge things that let's be honest not a lot of people can actually provide because you're always a little bit worried is this relationship going to work out is this person trying to get something out of me but with the dog you don't have to worry about that yeah. so once people understand look i'm getting all of this from my dog whether it be emotional support companionship fun affection the rest of it and then i say to them okay so that's what they're giving you. Would you be willing to put some effort towards giving them what they need in terms of providing them with the exercise that they need, the, with the socialize, uh, yeah. the, like meeting other dogs and, you know, playing off leash and all that kind of stuff. And people will start to understand, wow, you know, it, I shouldn't be asking so much if I'm not giving mm. something in return. And, uh, that's the toughest thing is trying to get people to change their habits, even slightly. People are resistant to it. Yeah, and I think the other thing that I see a lot of is how dogs sort of mirror, obviously, their owner's behavior as well. Mm. And I know that you spend a lot of time helping people with behavioral issues with dogs, and I, I suspect that most of your training is the people rather than the dogs. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when I'm down in the park with my dogs and I see someone coming towards me with their dog and from 50 yards away, you can spot if there's going to be a problem or not. Yeah. And you can spot it from the owner. So the owner is either there like this with their dog and they're all tensed up and they're looking at you thinking, yikes, there's going to be a problem. Yeah. There's going to be a problem. Or the dog's relatively relaxed. It's like the owner's relatively relaxed. The dogs are going to take care of themselves. If there's a little yap, it's all good. And... But it's amazing that, and I can see how dogs can make certain people anxious. Um, and I'm very careful about my dogs around people that don't have dogs with them, because people that don't have dogs with them, understandably, may be not like dogs or be anxious about dogs, and so it's understandable. But people who choose to have a dog, and you see that they're really anxious with their dogs and transferring their anxiety to their dogs, it always concerns me a bit, because actually you really want to sort of say to those people, you know, she'll have confidence in your dog. The, the dog will derive confidence from your confidence and yeah. it will be fine kind of thing. It's a, it's one of those chicken and the egg things, yeah. right? So where people have difficulty is, and this is usually the way it happens, the dog will have some sort of bad experience. So let's say, for example, uh, the last dog that I worked with, little 10 pound Morky got attacked uh, when it was pretty young, but two years old. And that caused trauma. And it wasn't her fault. The other dog was, you know, doing whatever. And that caused the owner to become anxious and upset. And all those things are understandable. But then they started down this path, both the, the person and the dog, because there was no resolution to that trauma so then the next time they saw that same dog they got even more nervous and anxious and then they started transferring that to other dogs that were of the same size or the same breed and then that became made the problem even worse and then so people go down this path not not because they intend to it's usually quite gradual but it's like this kind of steady progression of one bad occurrence turns into this path where things get worse and yeah, worse and yeah. worse. Yeah. And I certainly wouldn't want to diminish a dog owner by saying they all tend to know that they just need to be confident because often it is more complex than that. Um, but it is, it's interesting how with work, with time, with, I, I think a lot of behavioral issues are solvable. 
Yes. Um, dogs like people. Like every now and again, there's a bad apple that <laughs> is always going to be a bad apple. But generally speaking, the majority, I think, are are very are very trainable. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing that people uh, are amazed at is how quickly the dogs move on. Yeah. So the the Morky that I was telling you about, this dog, and this is very common for a lot of people who I work with. Um, the owner was saying, oh, well, this dog has been displaying this type of behavior, aggression, nervousness, anxiety, for over two years. And the first afternoon that I worked with her, 10, 15 minutes later, dog was almost unrecognizable from its former self. So uh, dogs are kind of, they get stuck. And they need someone to come along to say, hey, look, here, let's do this a little bit differently. <laughs> but they move on really quickly. Um, another dog that I worked with, her name was Georgie, was was uh, incredibly dramatic and violent. She was the one that I showed in that talk. Okay, yeah. That was the dog that I showed in that clip. And she had been like that for a really long time, too. And within a half hour of working with the owner, completely different. So even if, you, even if you know, a dog is displaying really consistent behavior problems for years and years and years, they can snap out of it very quickly. It's the people that take quite a long time to to work with yeah uh, because people's anxieties and fears don't go away that quickly whereas dogs dogs want to move on very quickly they they very much live in the moment they don't hold grudges yeah. they don't you know what i mean they don't remember that oh this particular dog was was growling at me the other day now i hate that dog they don't think like that so the dogs can move on uh, really quickly the people that take a lot more work and uh, you're right. So about, I would say about 80% of the work that I do is with the people. Oh, here's something fun. So we've been talking a lot about like serious stuff, but I wanted to do like a fun little segment, uh, <laughs> segment called uh, strange things that dog lovers do. And so the, the podcast is obviously going to be geared towards dog lovers. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to really understand this kind of thing. But I also want people who aren't dog lovers to kind of understand, empathize where we're coming from. There's a lot of strange things that, that dog uh, owners, dog, dog lovers do that like other people look at and they're like, that's very strange. But dog lovers don't think that. So off the top of your head, can you think of... I got one. I got one. <laughs> I got okay. one straight away. <laughs> okay. This is funny. You, okay, you tell me yours, and then I'll go to mine. Okay. I'm driving along in the car with yeah. my wife. My son's in the back, and my wife's there. We're driving along the street. It's a busy street, and I'm looking around, and I'll say to my wife, check out that husky. That's mm. a beautiful dog. And we're driving along. And I say, oh, man, look at that pup over there. That's just a little baby. It's so sweet. Mm. Not, my wife says to me, she says, you know what? I've never seen you check out women like other people. Like every comment is around this dog or that dog or anything else like that. And like if anyone was listening to you, they just think that's totally weird. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny. That's whether I'm with a bloke pal of mine and my wife and said, I'll point out a dog on the street. Like, yeah. That's a beautiful dog. You know? Yeah. I'll be walking down the street with a friend of mine and I'll, I'll do the same thing. I'll be like, oh my God, look at that little guy. He's got to be like eight weeks old or something like that. And it's kind of this natural... Like, you almost gravitate right towards them. They look at me like, yeah, okay, it's another dog. Yeah, there's like 100 dogs around. But you're right, absolutely. Yeah. Here's a strange one. Have you ever had a conversation with either your family or let's say somebody that you didn't really know that well, maybe another dog lover, about your dog's poops? My dog's poops. Like, they're... they're uh, um, no, not particularly. Oh, really? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. I went to the dog park the other day, and I started talking to a couple people, and they were in the most in-depth conversation about their, their their dog's fecal matter wow. that I had ever heard. And then 
I was talking to a friend of mine and we were on a walk and her dog took a poop and she just, we just started talking about the different poops and how like, you know, firm it is and how like, because you're picking it up, it's obviously something that you're, you're noticing a lot of. I noticed a couple people kind of overhearing our conversation and just kind of <laughs> giving us this, oh, okay, you guys a little, you know. But, uh, yeah, I find that there's a lot of things like that that are very specific to dog lovers or dog yeah. owners. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's a whole – there's whole <laughs> sections on YouTube devoted to people that like looking at dogs. Yeah. So whether I'll watch anything from Crufts Agility Challenges to dog shows to documentaries about working dogs to whatever it is to – you know, the point where, you know, again, my wife sort of says, well, that's just, that's weird. You know, that's, you know, you're, you're either watching cricket or watching stuff about dogs. <laughs> you know, that's just two things that you watch on YouTube. <laughs> I had an interesting conversation with someone just recently about dogs. It's a lady that's um, worked for my company for a number of years. And mm. she um, comes from Indi India. And in India, she lived in a small town in India. Very, very different circumstances to life here in Canada. Mm -hmm. And she talked about their relationship with dogs. And she said in the town that she lived in, the dogs were kind of owned street by street. Oh. So nobody in the individual house owned one of the dogs. But in their street, there was a couple of strays that that was their territory. Mm. The next street was a couple of other strays. Next street was a couple of other strays. And different people in that street, that the street together would band together to look after the dogs. So someone would be feeding them dogs sick. Someone would be taking care of them. Everyone would keep an eye on them for the dogs. The dogs kind of protected that street. That was their territory. The dogs really? kept the other strays off their territory. There'd be common okay. areas of dogs might hang in, but <laughs> that's where they lived. Really? And it was really interesting to me. Yeah, it was just a sort of a culturally different, it made total sense when you think about it. Dogs are very territorial creatures and sure. they don't necessarily be tied to one, they don't have to be tied to one individual person, although I think that master relationship is very important to the dogs. Um, but it's just interesting, you know, to, to listen to that and to, 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 you can picture it and sort of see how that works. Yeah, I think living in Western society, we look at dogs um, in a much different way, I think, than other cultures. And I think there's a definite, I don't want to call it a misunderstanding, but there's a term, I can't remember what it is, but it, it's basically judging other cultures by your own values. Yeah, cultural appropriation, you might call that in some ways in terms of um, – it's not – cultural appropriation is more when you take on other cultures' values that aren't really yours. Um, but I understand what you mean, yeah. So the one that comes to mind that's very controversial is the um, festivals. Have you heard of these? In, I can't remember if it's Thailand or where they torture dogs. Yeah. and then eat them and sorry if this is yeah, too yeah, disturbing yeah. for anybody i might cut it out because people aren't going to want to yeah. but i mean like and it's very strange so the theory is the more pain or suffering the dog experiences the better it's gonna taste yeah and there's a part of that uh, unfortunately i do know a little bit about it because i lived in china for many years where the practice was not common but it happened there's something around how dogs in pain and tensing up and the flow of blood to the muscles and everything else like that makes them be tender or whatever the heck it is. There's, mm. there's something physical about that chemical reaction when the dogs are really scared that makes that work. And I, I find the subject very difficult because to me, when I read anything about any form of animal cure, cruelty, um, whether it's dog fighting or just whatever is like that, it, it's, I, I have a disproportionate reaction to it in terms of, unfortunately, I'll read about an earthquake somewhere where 500 people are killed and just skip over it in a second. But you read about some sort of dog fighting in New Orleans and involving five dogs and your blood boils and you want to know what you can do to sort it out kind of thing. It's yeah. that, maybe it's, it's that, that, that defenselessness of dogs in the face of, abuse from people which is very tough to deal with i think dogs are very innocent mm. and and they're very um 
trusting in yep. terms of they don't necessarily know whether somebody's going to have ill intentions yeah. um, in terms of how they're going to treat them yeah. or not. But if you flip the script, let's say, for example, you live in India where cows are sacred. And then you look at North American culture yeah. where we love our red meat. Yeah. I mean, myself included. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you mm. know, they might be horrified by we our farming in a very different way than they would practices or, or the rest of it. Yeah. But that particular festival, uh, I know Ricky Gervais w was very vocal about bringing attention to it. And I know a lot of rescue organizations have gone over and, and rescued a lot of dogs because um, you, you see them. They're very unusual looking dogs and they're very distinctive. They're usually quite skinny and yeah. lanky and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah, so there's a lot of of activity in terms of actually going over and trying to save as, as many of these dogs as possible. But then like somebody like me, I try not to judge. Even though like I'm personally horrified. Mm -hmm. I have to kind of take a step back and say, okay, but in that culture, it's it's not just acceptable. It's just part of their culture. Yeah. So should we, as North Americans, judge other people or other cultures by those practices? I mean, I don't think there's anyone who would say, yeah, that's okay. They should be able to do that. But is that all right? Well. Wow. The answer is a, a couple of parts. I mean, firstly, your attention probably has to be focused more where on an area you can control. So in North America, there's plenty of issues with dogs to take your attention here in terms of how we can improve their livelihoods and improve the relationship between dogs and men and everything else like that. I think on a broader cultural level, for sure, we have our opinions on what goes on over there. And... Kind of sounds futile. We sort of do what we can. I think that it's something that you take a personal stance in terms of you would never countenance involvement in yourself, you never countenance involvement in it from anybody you know, and you never encounter you never countenance being encouraged in any way. Right. As you say, whether it's your place to and what power you have to actively get engaged with stopping it. Let, let's say, for example, let's put this question a different way. Let's say I was fortunate enough to make a lot of money in my life and I settled up and I said, right, I'm going to use my money to improve the lives of dogs around the world because I love dogs so much. Mm -hmm. Where would you get the best bang for your buck in terms of you could probably spend an unlimited amount of money just here in North America dealing with some of the problems you've got here mm -hmm. or however much money you have, how would that necessarily affect what may or may not go on in China or in Thailand or what have you? Mm -hmm. um, as a, as a, dog lover first and foremost i suspect that um unfortunately you have to put your time love and money where it's going to have the most effect and the biggest bang for your buck um yeah it's interesting i i, I don't know whether i would say that um it's a question of their cultural values are different rather than right or wrong mm -hmm. um but it's a question of you know what power authority or right actually can you have to change it um yeah it's a tough one even to think about and i think a lot of people do struggle with those types of things i mean the world has become a very small place you know we live in this information age where you know you can find out so many things so quickly and with social media, things go viral very quickly. And then you have, you know, advocates who are celebrities mm -hmm. who are bringing attention to it. Like we're talking about, so Ricky Gervais, I mean, you know who he is. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a huge, famous star. He actually included like that uh, subject in his stand-up. I went to go see him in Toronto mm -hmm. and it was part of his stand-up. And he loves dogs and is a huge advocate for animal rights and, and stuff like that and i had never even heard about it before but 
you know, you don't figure, hey, I'm going to see this amazing comedian. I'm going to laugh my ass off tonight. And then you come out like horrified of, oh, my God, I didn't even know this festival existed. And now I have to go and see, like, what is there to do? But to your point, I think a lot of people have taken the stance of, well, let's do what we can. So that's why I think a lot of um, Canadians and Americans and I'm sure people from all over the world have gone over and, and have rescued as many of these dogs as possible. Yeah, and I think that's something that you can do, like rescuing a dog from child. I mean, personally, I just, I wouldn't take a purebred dog myself. I'd always have a rescue dog because there's so much, there's so much more need for homes for rescue dogs. Um, and I think that probably is a realistic approach in terms of the most practical thing of where you can help. Um, it's interesting, you know, as someone who, as my life goes on, one of my sort of ambitions is to do more with dogs, whatever that may be, mm -hmm. because dogs, as what I find in my life, gives me the most profound sense of happiness mm -hmm. is being around dogs. So is that something where I just, you know, retire to the country one day with a big bunch of dogs? Is it something where I'm actively involved with helping dogs through a rescue center or through whatever it is, or mm -hmm. actively involved with, you know, I'm not qualified to train dogs necessarily, but it's interesting. It's a thought that comes across my mind a lot at the moment as I sort of feel about as you go to, you know, different phases in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, the one thing, you know, I'm now 51 years old and I look back on my life with, and if anybody said, you know, what, you know, if any friends were, talking about me and I wasn't in the room, they say, oh, well, tell me something about Mark. And they would say, you know, he loves his family, he loves his business, he loves dogs, <laughs> you know. But, you know, dogs would always come up as something yes. that I'd love to do. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because I'm, you know, sort of spending a lot of time and money thinking about how am I going to get more involved with dogs as I get older because it is something that just gives me so much pleasure. Yeah. Um, and just, it, it's amazing. My energy is totally different in a room if there are dogs in the room. Mm -hmm. than if there aren't dogs in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find, you know, we're in a relatively small apartment here with two big dogs. And to me, having the two big dogs in the presence sitting at our feet, it's just a really nice... Comforting. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, yeah, yeah. it's an intangible feeling that... And that's why so many dogs now are, are becoming therapy dogs. And really their roles are starting to evolve. Yeah. In terms of like it, sight dogs, hearing dogs, all that kind of stuff has been around for a long time. Yeah. I'm really interested in therapy dogs because I can see the effect myself of my son's not feeling well. And, you know, one of my dogs will go up and nuzzle with my son and just calm him down for a few minutes. Um, and I'm really interested in learning about how dogs can be used better as therapy dogs in all sorts of different circumstances. So from what the limited knowledge I have, I can see that there's sort of relatively low level therapy dogs who may do hospital visits, school visits, mm -hmm. be able to just be there for people to pet and calm down. And then you have dogs who are more specifically trained to be companions for people with PTSD and, therapy and autism, maybe where they're specifically trained to do certain tasks. But I kind of feel that there must be a spectrum from here to here with maybe blind guide dogs for the blind sort of at the top or specialist ammunition, explosive dogs or whatever it is like that to working dogs all the way down to dogs who are just there. But they actually have a job to do, which is to go in and comfort people and calm people down in old people's homes or hospitals, whatever it is. And I would love to be involved somewhere with um, a charity that takes dogs through this first part of it, yeah. that lower level. So. When you, when you see a stray dog come in, I always feel that dogs really appreciate having a purpose and a working environment and be given a structure around their lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the best dogs as companions are properly trained dogs. Imagine somewhere where there was a, a, a settlement place where stray dogs could come in and be trained, maybe be assessed. One in a thousand dogs maybe could be some kind of very well-trained service dog. But a lot of dogs might be suitable for lower level service dogs. 
and imagine a facility that comes and trains all the dogs and they're sort of sorted at the end is either they just go out to homes being properly trained mm -hmm. or they go out to places where they can play an active role in society and work and be it just as a therapy dog or as a sort of lower level therapy dog depending because i think it's very expensive to train a proper service dog um and i haven't quite i i can't quite get my head completely around it yet how it would work i mean there's obviously that's something that there's no one's going to pay you to do that and you know it's something that you would have to be pretty well funded to be able to do but you know whether you're training 10 20 or 50 dogs a year through somewhere like this that would affect a lot of lives um you know to, to me it is amazing when i see a dog that is directly affecting the life of a human being in a positive way you say wow and that may just be being, being a well-behaved companion um or it may be you know someone you know a dog that's actually working to um working to help a specific you know element or problem so it's really interesting i it's it's something that i really you know want to explore as time goes on and you know that would be something that would be a really um profound way to um profound way to give back something to the animals that have given me so much in my life that's why i started the the youtube channel and yep. now that's why we're doing the podcast is to my goal has always been to help as many dogs and help as many people as a result of that yep. at the same time as possible yeah and the work that I do is is very niche. It's it's very low volume. It's very labor intensive. Yeah. It, it takes a lot of personal time and and energy. And so the YouTube channel, at the beginning, it was a joke. It, it was like I don't think this is going to work. I don't know anything about this. This is just a bunch of silly people doing silly things. Like, but then I started to think about it in terms of, well what i hear from people is that they feel isolated so they feel like all the other dogs in the world are great but it's just my dog that has this issue or it's just this person who has a problem with their dog but it's rare and what i try to help people to understand is that it's very common it's very common a lot of people experience it but yet they feel alone because what tends to happen is people isolate themselves and they isolate their dogs when they start having problems. So the purpose of the YouTube channel is to help spread that word, even if it's just understanding that you're not alone, that there's other people out there with dogs that have issues and their dogs have recovered. So maybe my dog can can recover and maybe give them some ideas or maybe, you know, get them to go seek out help and the rest of it as you say though it takes a lot of love to do that because it's very hard to make a living doing it takes a lot of work it's something that has to be a real labor of love and a labor of passion oh yeah <laughs> um you know whatever i think about ideas i may or may not have about having some kind of facility for dogs later in life and you know i speak to about it to my brother-in-law is also my financial advisor he's, he's, he's he looks at this one which has this is a terrible look. idea <laughs> <laughs> how would you ever do something like that it just doesn't make any sense so here's here's the exercise so uh, you come from a very creative space yep. very innovative uh industry you know right on the cutting edge of technology and, and all this lovely stuff so one of the things i want to talk to you about is the creative process and then Later on, what I wanted to do is see if we could do some crowdsourcing, almost like a brainstorm, but with the audience. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's going to work. Mm -hmm. This is one of those things where, in theory, like in my head, I'm like, oh, this is a good idea. Okay. Let, let, let's do this. So um, I also uh, come from you know, the ad industry, so I'm very familiar with the creative process, but I'm always interested to see people's take on it um, in terms of what actually happened. Like what are the steps that people go through either in a professional sense or like just in a general sense, because 
Uh, creativity is one of those things I, I think is highly underrated in society. And I think it's something that's very much, I don't know if suppressed is too strong of a word. But basically, if you think about the most creative time in your life, and I ask people this a lot, like in interviews, and stuff, I'm like, when do you think you're the most creative in your life? And almost always people give me the same answer, which is when you're a kid. So when you're, you know, whatever, five years old, six years old, all you're doing is playing and imagining different things and, you know, being an astronaut and going off to space and coming up with all these great ideas. And as you get older and older, that creativity, that imagination, that spark gets dulled. Either maybe because it's not used or because, you know, your teachers or your colleagues are like, hey, you know, we don't need any of those crazy ideas. We just want you to do X to Y. Or, yeah, you or might whatever. get to a certain point in your life where it's about maintenance rather than creating new stuff. I mean, you're, you're, you're busy doing what you do. Yeah. So when you actually challenge people to say, hey, here's here's a problem or here's something, I need you to come up w with a creative solution to, to solve this. People get a bit stumped in terms of that. Why don't we start with the origin of the idea? Where do your ideas come from? Well, certainly in our business, we're a design company that great solutions for specific problems. So as opposed to being a company where we design com completely new products from scratch, mm -hmm. our creativity comes from how to interpret and resolve an issue that's brought to us. Mm -hmm. So a customer will come to us and say, you know what, I want to have a, you know, we're, we're doing this fantastic, we're building this fantastic building. We want the lobby, lobby to be truly spectacular. Mm -hmm. We'd like you guys to come up with something really innovative for us. Mm -hmm. So there, you have something which is a very broad canvas. So they've come to you and they've given you the starting point, which is just there. And your job is to take it to there, which is this fantastic, beautiful installation, which is going to rock their world. A lot of our process there is helping them think through what it is they want. Mm -hmm. So we have a sort of particular process we go through in our business where someone comes to us the easiest thing to do is to sell them the idea by sketching and giving them something visual so they can say, wow, that's so cool. I really want something like that. No, actually what we do is we'll go through this process we call discovery with them. So discovery process will really make sure that they've articulated their issue in the right way. And we understand before we do any design at all, the problem that we're dealing with. So we always start by articulating the problem, making sure we really understand what the challenge is and how we're going to solve it, what needs to get done before any design is done. Right. And at that point, we write it down for them and we say, okay, this is what we've heard from you. This is your timeline. This is your budget. This is what you're trying to do. This is why you're trying to do it. This is who the stakeholders are. This is what the physical constraints of the environment is. This is how it's going to either manifest itself, whatever that may be. There's, there's a whole sort of process around it. And we'll come back to them and they'll say, have we heard you correctly in terms of this is what you're trying to achieve? And the answer will be yes or yes, but you've got to tweak this, this, and this. We then have a document before we do design that allows us to have freedom and creativity within the bounds that are set because freedom of creativity outside of the bounds can be brilliant, but it's a very tough way to go about getting the right solution. It's going to often take longer, it's riskier, it's, it's a less controlled way. And this is where perhaps our company is a little different in that I'm a commercial guy who is the head of the company, not a designer. Right. So I work with a lot of designers and we have some very brilliant people on the design side of it. My job commercially is defining the parameters, making sure it makes sense, making sure that what we come up with is actually going to work for people. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, I would like to say that we have a tremendous creative freedom, but it's bordered on either side with the realities that we define of the situation up front. So the scope. Yes. Is, and I think that's actually quite important because if you're, if you're too broad, then it actually 
makes things a little bit more difficult in terms of finding some focus. Yeah, and if you're too broad, there's nothing worse in a, in a design project is going down a route that really excites yourself and the design team, taking it back to the client, and it's something that they either don't have the money for or it's off side in terms of what they really want or need in the space. Mm. Those terrible words, well, it's beautiful, it's fantastic, but it's just not appropriate for us. <laughs> right. It's the worst things you ever want to hear yeah, because exactly. you've burnt all this time. Right. Well, will you still pay us for the time? You know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, uh, creativity and having a um, really cherishing creativity is very, very important, mm -hmm. but putting a structure around it is very important. Um, and it's interesting, you know, within my business, we we talk about our three core values. The three core values in my company are creativity, collaboration, and commitment. Mm. Now, creativity is the first value. The reason why it's our first core value is that we realize as a business that we're about creativity. Creativity is the engine room of our business. It's about creativity in everything that we do. So whether that's solving our own internal problems, um, designing totally new ideas, whatever it may be, we, we try and cherish creativity. But we understand at the same time that creativity has its challenges and has yes. its costs. So we need to take a mindful approach to understanding that if you're going to encourage creativity, you have to understand what some of the side effects of creativity, creativity will be mm. and take a reasonable attitude towards how you deal with those. Um, and so as much as, as much as you can realistically to I say contain the creativity, but make sure the creativity is living within bounds that keeps things on track, I think is really important. I think that's really interesting because unbridled creativity um, I mean, I've been in brainstorms before. Mm -hmm. I've, I've facilitated many brainstorms. And what always uh, fascinated me is the more, you know, the more, I don't want to call it structure, but the more framework you give it, the more shape ideas can actually take. So they can actually develop, you know. So it, the way I think of it is like you have this idea. For whatever it is and a lot of times it's solving a problem or coming up with uh, something new or different and then somebody has that idea and then it needs to grow it needs to evolve it has a life cycle it needs to bounce around maybe it changes maybe it shape shifts maybe it you know turns into something different and then you you have something that's workable, something that's that's tangible, something that can be actually applied. And so the reason why I'm I'm going through all this discussion with you is because I want to help you to realize this legacy idea of yours. Because I think there's this beautiful nugget, there's this beautiful um, acorn, and you know, you have this vision of this amazing oak tree, but there's a lot of challenges, yeah. like you said in there. Yeah. So it's almost like having that creative brief of saying, okay, guys, this, this is what I want to do. This is the legacy I want to leave. This is, I, I know I want to do something this, yeah, but I don't know what it is yet. And yeah. And there's a lot of challenge in terms of understanding what can be done what can't be done or how could it could it evolve how could it grow maybe it starts here with the idea that in five ten years it develops to there mm -hmm. or, or whatever it is and i'm a big fan of crowdsourcing mm -hmm. um especially like for ideas it's not a new concept but it's i think an underutilized concept and there's so much negativity in social media. Yeah. But there's also this other side to it that that's really positive and beautiful. And so one of the things that I see a lot with dog owners, dog lovers, is that they spend a lot of time arguing with each other and trying to see who's right or wrong about this era, the rest of it, oh, well, if, if you don't feed your dog raw food, this isn't good. And if you have a big dog, that's bad. And if you take your dog to the off-leash park, that's this. And 
so what I want to try and do with this podcast and with the channels is start bringing people together. Hmm. I really yeah. think that dogs, especially dogs, should be something that brings people together instead of... You see, I think that's a fantastic idea. I, I, I really like what you're talking about. Yeah. So why don't you give us a high-level brief? And as I don't know if it's going to work, but as a as a as a, a community of dog lovers and of people who know other dog aficionados, maybe trainers and the rest of it, maybe we can come up with some ideas that will help you further your dream, your vision of this amazing legacy. Mm. I don't know if it'll work. Yeah. Maybe two people will comment with their ideas. Maybe nobody will comment. Well, maybe the other two people will be me and you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I figure I would put it out there. Yeah. Uh, because one of the other things that I want the, the, the podcast to be is engaging mm. in terms of this isn't just something for you to watch on YouTube or to listen to on iTunes, um, but this is something that you could actually participate in. And who knows? Maybe somebody will have a great idea that will spark yeah. another one. It's interesting. It's a really interesting concept, and I think it's a very positive concept. So I applaud you for <laughs> thinking of it, because often some people would say, oh, you know, I don't really want to talk about it because it's not really thought through and everything like that. Sure, but I'm very, um, I'm very open to giving it a crack and yeah. seeing what comes out. Yeah, yeah. I figured you'd be yeah a, an open-minded kind of guy because you're here. <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> for sure. Um, so why don't you uh, give the audience um, a bit more of a creative brief? So similar to what you were describing. Yeah, you know, give them some scope, give them an idea of what you want to achieve, and let's see if we can come up. With some ideas. So I want to be really mindful of the fact that I haven't thought about this in advance. It's just, but but I'm really aware that particularly over the last couple of years, uh, an idea has been germinating in my mind. Mm -hmm. And the idea is about what, Mark, what really gives you the most pleasure in life? And where do you feel you could make a difference in the world? Mm -hmm. So will you make a difference by making X amount of money or by doing this or by doing that? But, you know, to me, those conversations tend to come back to dogs with me in terms of where do I find my most profound sense of happiness? Mm -hmm. And if there was one thing that I could sort of leave behind or create, it would, in my mind, be around dogs. And so in my mind, I have this idea, and I've been thinking about it for a while. It's about, I want to devote some time and attention to, how can I put this, furthering the relationship between man and dogs. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that it's a very important sacrosanct relationship in the history of our time. I think that it's something where dogs can be a tremendous benefit to mankind and mankind can be a tremendous benefit to dogs. Mm -hmm. And being around dogs gives me a huge amount of pleasure. And so over the years, I've been sort of thinking about whether I would like to have a piece of farm property that takes in dogs. And, you know, I've been up to see dog tales up in King City fantastic facility i don't know the people that run it i'm sure they're lovely people um but i'm a businessman i do the sums in my mind mm -hmm. I, I can see what it costs to run a place like that and nobody pays to take the dogs away they're very fortunate and i think they've done a wonderful thing imagine having the kind of money that they have and deciding not to buy a super yacht but spending the money on dogs it's fantastic and noble. yeah uh, i'm very fortunate in my business in that i feel that whereas I'm still working 24, 7, 60 hours a week, um, that's not going to be the case forever. And I think I'm hopeful, you never know in business, but I'm hopeful that um, by the time I'm ready to take it a bit easier, I'll be in a financial position whereby I'd be able to devote a fair chunk of money to looking after dogs if that's the way I decide to go. I have a couple of challenges. One of the challenges is, Obviously, I don't have unlimited funds. Secondly, I'm, you know, currently have an organization where there's 30 people or something working for me, and it's quite tough running a lot of people. I don't want to be the day-to-day -day manager mm -hmm. of a facility with a lot of staff and the same kind of problems that you've got, you're getting out of business to have. 
but I do feel like I I would like to make a difference in the lives of dogs and the lives of people. My my instinct has always been around a requirement to. There's a lot of dogs out there that need a home, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of dogs that I think would really benefit from professional training. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's on the other side of that families that would benefit from being able to adopt dogs that are very well trained and also a certain amount of dogs that can could go on and do some useful jobs in society mm-hmm. probably if i had a, a great amount of funds maybe all the way up to being sort of trained guide dogs but probably more on the low level sort of lower level therapy dogs um i just have an instinct that there's a great place for that so if I sort of close my eyes and picture a facility like that, that's a facility, you know, somewhere reasonably close to Toronto that has some land, some really nice buildings where it can house, I don't know, 10, 20, 50 dogs maybe, and it trains them, gives them a really loving circumstance, Mm -hmm. and then rehouses them into society, hopefully as more useful contributing members be they just as pets or dogs or whatever that is yeah. now obviously the numbers for somewhere like that that's not something where people are going to pay you to take dogs it's something that has to sustain itself either by the goodwill of its owner um, maybe there's some element there i would love that facility to be open to school kids to come and to be able to learn about how dogs are taken care of and how dogs are trained I think there might be some small element of corporate sponsorship, but probably the reality is that's something that I'd have to fund the majority of myself. What I'm, no, I struggle with a couple of things. I don't really know if my wife would stand <laughs> one <laughs> town and go and live surrounded by dog poop in the countryside. My, you know, they're both huge dog lovers. Yeah. But it's not something that they're sort of saying, you know, Mark, we've got to go and move out of town and live in a small farm somewhere. And I'm not sure whether that's something that I want to run 24-7 myself. Right. Um, which, again, you know, means, you know, does lead to um, the question about, you know, how it's going to be funded. It's something which I would love to fund. It's something also that I would love to put my business sense to how to make it successful. Yeah. Where, you know, what am I good at? I'm much better at talking to RBC about corporate sponsorship than I am. <laughs> about being the guy dealing with the day-to-day kind of issues at the, at, at the farm or the dog facility, wherever it is. Sure. Um, something like that has to be set up in such a way that it would long outlive me mm. because, okay, you may have a benefactor to get it started, right? but that's not going to be, you know, there's no point in this place being there for 10 years and then someone gets bored of it and it's not there anymore. Right. Uh, well, it's, I wouldn't say there's no point. The 10 years is still important. It's just not, you know, the, the ideally you want to create something that can self-sustain in some way. To me, that, that that's an interesting challenge. How to make a place like this self-sustaining, how to make it so that it can pay for itself in the long term, mm-hmm. how to make it so that where you can perceive a great good for society, the good is you're taking stray dogs um, and you're creating something worthwhile from them that is actually going to help people. There is a value proposition there somewhere. Of course. How do you make that in some way, shape or form pay for itself? Um, so that's always been my idea about one way that I would be able to fulfill my selfish personal dream about being involved with dogs. I'm sure there's a hundred variations of that. What I'd be really interested in is like variations on that in terms of, you know, people have spoken to me, you know, there's thousands of Huskies that are older in life that actually just need a beautiful home to rest at the end of a tough life when nobody really values them when they're much older mm-hmm. or, you know, taking one breed and looking after that particular breed. You know, I saw this wonderful show about um, a company, I think it's down in Boston that only deal with German shepherds and they train dogs purely as PTSD dogs for soldiers and they're purely German shepherds. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm really interested in open in thinking about other ideas about where I can better help that relationship with people and dogs together. Mm-hmm. That idea I just talked about myself was the closest I've got to articulating where I feel it could work. 
Um, does that kind of start to answer your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's always difficult when you're at the 10,000 foot view. Yep. And, and when I say 10,000 foot view, I just mean you're at a high level, mm -hmm. meaning you have a vision. And uh, the, the translation of a vision into fruition, something that's tangible and real, is, is not an easy journey. It, it's a, a very difficult um, undertaking yeah. to take a concept, an idea, a dream, whatever you want to call it, yeah. and then turn it into, let's face it, something practical something that can actually work and function. And you're right, in an ideal situation, if you had unlimited funds, that it would make things very easy and you wouldn't uh, be debating in your mind or, or having this difficult. And that's why I want to put it out to the viewers to see in terms of, so go ahead. Let me just yep. say, it may well be the situation could be completely turned on its head. There may be 20 places like this already out there. What they're struggling for is someone to help them along who has some business experience and some funds. That could be the case. Rather than me thinking through how am I going to bang the fences in to sure. you know, keep the dogs from running away, yeah, you know, which is not necessarily my strength. Right. So articulating the idea and that where I'd like to get to is – helping dogs as my legacy and leaving something behind which is set up to you know do something worthwhile hopefully long after i'm gone um that's the end game yes to get there i have no preconceived notions of right whether that's me buying a property and doing it up and living there and working there for a while telling my wife sometime that that's going to happen you know before it happens <laughs> or whether it is someone comes to me and says mark i've been doing this for five years and i'm struggling I'd love someone to come and help. Sure. You know, um, and you know, it's funny, just thinking about that is something that, this is something that I want to start putting some time and money into now, but it's not something that I can do full time for quite some time yet because my business is nowhere quite near done yet. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And it's one of those things where um, somebody watching this or somebody listening to it might say, hey, you know what? There's all these different organizations, but they're they're in silos. Yeah. Yeah. And what they really need is somebody like you who can bring them together and 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 leverage different aspects of what's already existing. Yeah. So maybe you have a rescue and there's lots of rescues around. Mm -hmm. And maybe you have somebody who specializes in um, therapy dogs and maybe you have so you have all these factions and i don't know i, I don't know the answers to that, yep. but i can imagine this kind of thing being like out there and then maybe people will say oh well xyz shelter is looking for and then so and and that's yeah the point right yeah it's funny because one of the things i figured is that because I don't have to do anything today, tomorrow, and next year, the year after, but I know it's something which is a dream of mine going forwards. What I actually had figured in my mind is I wanted to spend the next year or two meeting people involved with dogs yeah. to learn a little bit about that world. Who's doing what? Kind of how does I don't know anything about the landscape out there. I know that it's full of incredibly passionate people mm -hmm. um, who are involved at all sorts of different levels, whether it is people who train guide dogs, people who foster dogs people who have their own little rescue facilities, individual families that just take in rescues, whatever it may be, down to all the way up to the kind of places like the dog tails of this world. There is an ecosystem somewhere there that I don't really know or understand yet, but I'd like to genuinely find the place in where I can best contribute to that ecosystem. Oh, 100%. I Literally, um, the other day, I talked to somebody from the University of Toronto who was doing research on uh, canine cognition. And I had no idea that research was even being done, let alone at U of T, which is like right in our city. And where it came from was I, 
I put a post up on social media asking people for ideas on interesting guests for the podcast. And all these really interesting people came out of the woodwork that had no, so I'm similar to you. I'm, and I'm in the dog world, like pretty heavily. So there was somebody who was doing chiropractic work. There was an acupuncturist uh, that did work with dogs. There was, um, you know, all, all these different people that I had no idea about. I mean, the, the, the work at U of T is just off the charts. Once I started reading about it, just, fascinating so it'll be fascinating those podcasts when you get those people in to talk about that kind of stuff, <laughs> it'll just be fascinating like you know, okay so- you guys heard it if, <laughs> if you if i can get somebody from u of t to come yeah. on the podcast you're gonna have a number one fan here that's gonna be yeah, yeah, tuning be in yeah i'll be fascinated just to see that yeah and so that's that's the thing so if anybody has ideas or has contacts um who of organizations or people who are doing this kind of thing. My, my thing about a legacy is it's that thing of if a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step, Mm kind of, you know what I mean? Like, even if you're not going to get there for another 10 years, let's say starting now, or at least, you know, getting a little bit of forward momentum. Momentum is a really interesting thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one thing leads to another and then leads to another and then oh, it... i would love the result of this hour and a half we spent together to be someone to come back out and say to you hey joe put me in touch with mark i'd love to show them what i'm doing out in Bolton, ontario or whatever it's like that you know someone who's been involved with the dog world or just is doing something that's interesting that will give me my next thought oh yeah okay that's interesting i never knew that was going on and then from there they might introduce me to someone else and you start to learn over a piece of time what that ecosystem looks like exactly yeah and and that's that's what i'm really really hoping for because i've seen it happen before yeah and it's interesting hindsight is always 2020 everybody will will tell you that and what's interesting is when people talk about very significant um, times in their life yeah whether it be really significant successes or basically their journey led them to this point when you ask them well where did it start it's usually in the most peculiar unexpected oh i was sitting down talking with this person we were having a cup of coffee they mentioned this and then this happened and then that happened but to trace that back you never know where This is going to happen. I mean, I would love for this to be like, not the start because you've already had the idea. You've already talked about it. You've already thought about it. But if somebody out there can say, Hey, look, there's this person at U of T doing this work. Yeah. And this is really cool. And then you have, I know for, for a fact that there are rescue organizations out there that don't have facilities that rely on volunteers. Yeah. So maybe it's a decentralized model that that might solve some of the problems. Like I'm just throwing yeah, yeah. some stuff out yeah. there. But the, the point is, is that when people hear about what you're doing, they get excited. I know I got excited. Mm. Yeah, dog people are very passionate. People that love Huge. dogs are very passionate. And they, yeah, I think they genuinely are interested and generally want to, I, I would I imagine that, yeah, no, no, I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, comment below um, if you have any ideas or if you know anybody or if you're interested in maybe hearing more about this uh, and and the podcast in general. I want to thank you a ton. I, I can't tell you how grateful I am with how generous you've been with your time, not just uh, in doing the first uh, podcast for the series. Hopefully it'll, it'll be uh, um, popular and people will like it, but um, supporting me, um, you know, talking to me before, even when there was, uh, no, uh, tangible job, Mark sat down and talked with me. Uh, he's been very, very generous. He came to a talk that I gave. He, um, was gracious enough and and generous enough to appear on this podcast. So thank thank you. you Yeah. I hope the podcast is a huge success. I think it's a great idea. These things take a lot of work. So like to see you 
you know, out there working so hard to get it set up. And there's a lot of people that really love dogs yeah. and who will benefit, hopefully enjoy in some small way what you're doing. Like, it's fantastic. I, and I hope so. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting to talk about it and who knows what comes out. You can get a, maybe one person puts a comment down there and there's someone that we can take something forward with and have a conversation. It'd be fantastic. We can dream big, right? You yeah, have to dream exactly. big. You have, exactly. to, you have to. If you yeah. if you don't, so uh, anybody out there can make a difference. I, I really want to to emphasize that. I mean, you don't need to be, um, you know, an expert in a, in a certain area. You don't need to. Um, all you need is that desire. Yeah, and I think if you're a dog lover, whether you're making the difference to the life of one dog or a thousand dogs. It's making a difference. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, oh, man. That was great. That was oh, awesome. Please. Thanks well, so that much. Was good. I really enjoyed it. It was great to chat. That's it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know I enjoyed making this dogcast. If you are interested in seeing more of these episodes, please leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. And if you know somebody who would be interested in being a guest on the Dogcast and is local to the greater Toronto area, please leave a comment below and let me know. Till next time, if you love your dog, take them for a walk. <laughs>